Showdown in New Hampshire, McCain versus Bush, Gore versus Bradley, and it looks like the independents may deliver some surprises on both sides in the first presidential primary. The hunt is on for answers to Alaska Airlines Flight 261's plunge into the Pacific off California. And a CBS News exclusive, watch a Russian spy at work in a sophisticated job of eavesdropping. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather reporting tonight from Bedford, New Hampshire. Good evening. There are two developing stories tonight. We're here in New Hampshire to cover an important early step in the process of choosing the next president of the United States. And there are early indications of possible surprises in both parties coming in the first primary campaign of 2000, a showdown between Al Gore and Bill Bradley on the Democratic side, George W. Bush and John McCain on the Republican side. Underdogs McCain and Bradley needed independent voters to turn out, and it looks like those independent voters did. McCain believes that he is a beneficiary of this large independent turnout. Bradley believes he gets a lot from the independent turnout. We'll have the headlines from New Hampshire, more about the surprises in a moment. But our other headline story tonight is the crash of Alaska Airlines Flight 261 off the California coast. No survivors have been found some 24 hours after the plane crashed in the Pacific with 88 people on board. Early evidence points to possible mechanical failure. The airline says this is unrelated to investigations into its maintenance and repair records, which have been under question. Right now, let's get a fast read from Bob Schieffer about the indications of surprises in the vote going on here in New Hampshire. Bob? Thank you, Dan. You know voters take many things into consideration when they decide who to vote for, and one conclusion we can draw from our exit polling today is New Hampshire Republicans like John McCain the man. His favorability rating was over 70 percent. That is astonishing. George Bush's favorable rating was over 50 percent. That's high, too, but nowhere near McCain, who seemed to be well-liked even among Republicans who did not vote for him. McCain promised straight talk, and Republicans apparently believed him on that. More than 60 percent of the Republicans who voted today said McCain says what he believes. Far fewer believe that Bush did. On the Democratic side, a couple of interesting things we can tell so far. The people who are voting for Gore believe issues are more important than personal qualities. The Bradley voters think personal qualities are more important. Democrats also say, Dan, that uh, Bradley's heart problems were not important, nor did they find his 11th hour attacks on Gore's veracity unfair. Bob Schieffer, thanks. As Bob and the rest of our Campaign 2000 team track this fast-breaking and in many ways surprising primary news, we'll get you back to politics in a few minutes. But right now we take you to CBS's Jerry Bowen, who has been out with the search teams at sea in the Alaska Airlines disaster. Daylight revealed a 15-square-mile debris field drifting off the California coast this morning, all that remains of Alaska Airlines Flight 261. Airplane pieces, someone's day planner, passports. Three kids. Three kids? And a one-way ticket from Puerto Vallarta. The most important discovery of the day, at least one, perhaps both, of the plane's black boxes. We have, in fact, heard a pinging. But recovery may be difficult. When TWA Flight 800 went down off New York's Long Island in 120 feet of water, it took divers seven days to bring up the black boxes. The shipping channel where the Alaska Airlines jet crashed yesterday is 700 feet deep. Well, and officially, the search is still on for survivors. The challenge is time. Uh, as time uh, clicks off, uh, risks go up. As the hours passed last night, the chance of anyone being found alive in the chilly 56 degree water was considered a miracle, especially surviving what Stephanie Surmat saw. Because all I saw was a wingspan on approximately a 45 degree angle doing a circle motion and the next thing I knew it just kept going into a circular and suddenly a huge plume of water came up. Commercial fishermen joined the Coast Guard in the early hours of the rescue effort, training their bright spotlights on a bobbing sea of litter and human remains. It looked like it was just shredded. Everything was shredded. And you see pieces of people that were small I and mean, just little little pieces and then big pieces and not, nothing made it through there. And there's little to be seen from shore today except for circling search planes and a lone beachside shrine to those who perished. 
So far, only four bodies have been recovered, and tomorrow a decision will be made if search and rescue officially becomes search and recovery. Dan? Jerry Bowen, thanks. The jetliner built by McDonnell Douglas, now owned by Boeing, was bound from Mexico to San Francisco and then on to Seattle. It was trying for an emergency landing in Los Angeles when it crashed. Aviation correspondent Bob Orr is covering the investigation into what caused this crash. Bob? Well, Dan, investigators tonight say they're encouraged by the news that the Coast Guard has picked up signals from at least one of the plane's two black boxes. Ultimately, those recorders could tell us what went wrong up there. But already investigators are focusing on the jet's tail and the possibility of a structural or mechanical failure. Alaska Airlines Flight 261 was cruising at 31,000 feet up the Southern California coast when the first sign of trouble appeared. The pilots alerted air traffic controllers they were having trouble controlling the aircraft. The crew checked in advising that they had a jammed stabilizer and were experiencing difficulty maintaining altitude. The stabilizer is the small wing in the tail that helps move a plane up and down. The jam on Flight 261 that the pilots talked about would have had the effect of forcing the plane into a dive. The pilots tried to troubleshoot the jam as they slowly descended, hoping to make an emergency landing at Los Angeles International Airport. But as the plane approached 17,000 feet, the pilots apparently lost control, and the jet nosed over in a high-speed vertical dive to the water. The MD-83 that crashed, shown here, was just eight years old, and it had a good safety record. No previous accidents or incidents, and only routine maintenance write-ups. Alaska Airlines also has a good safety record, but investigators will take a new look at its operations. Both the FAA and a federal grand jury have recently investigated alleged irregularities with Alaska's maintenance of its MD-80 fleet. Investigators will also check the airline's compliance with FAA safety orders. This one, issued last May, requires all airlines to check MD-80s for possible corrosion in the tail, which the FAA warns could result in reduced structural integrity of the airplane. The inspection must be completed by this fall. Alaska says the plane that crashed had not undergone that specific safety check. But at this point, there's no evidence at all that corrosion, or for that matter, any kind of maintenance problem, played any role in the crash. However, investigators at this point can't rule out anything. Dan? Bob Orr. Alaska Airlines confirmed today that its maintenance and repair records have been under investigation by law enforcement. CBS's Sandra Hughes has been tracking that part of the story. What happens inside Alaska Airlines Central Maintenance Facility in Oakland, California, is the subject of a year-long federal grand jury investigation. Former lead mechanic John Leotine blew the whistle to investigators after he claimed he witnessed supervisors falsifying maintenance records, which he says could have endangered the lives of passengers. He voiced his concerns about the maintenance of the MD-80 aircraft months ago. There is a lot of pressure to get aircraft out on time, when our um, flying schedule has increased by, uh, and I'm making a rough guesstimate, about 50% daily. In documents obtained by CBS News, Leotine claims management approved of maintenance checks that never happened. But the head of Alaska Airlines says they go above and beyond other airlines in their maintenance. Uh, we have done a thorough investigation and we found nothing. We we know we have the safest, finest group of maintenance people in the industry out there. Law enforcement sources tell CBS News this is a serious investigation, but caution against drawing any connection between these alleged maintenance problems and yesterday's deadly crash. However, the airline has been hammered by other accusations by its own employees, who claim that fumes that can seep inside the MD-80 cabins have caused serious health problems. Alaska Airlines continues to deny those allegations as well. Sandra Hughes, CBS News, Los Angeles. Up next on the CBS Evening News, more from New Hampshire, where the polls are still open, but many of them are about to close. We'll have the latest on what may be a surprising presidential primary in both parties. And later, first pictures of a Russian spy caught at his listening post. But who planted the bug he was listening to? Back down in New Hampshire, where most of the polls in the first presidential primary of campaign 2000 will be closing in just a few minutes, and we'll have the first returns right at the top of this hour. There's widely expected there will be some surprises. The man with the most at stake here 
is Republican Senator John McCain, who believes he got a big boost today from independent voters. McCain skipped last week's Iowa caucuses and put all his time and resources into trying to upset the national frontrunner, George W. Bush, here in New Hampshire. It was against that backdrop that I sat down today with Senator McCain and his wife Cindy in Manchester. McCain talked about the importance of New Hampshire for his campaign and looked ahead to the next battle in South Carolina. Uh, we have to do very well here, and we have to do very well in South Carolina as well. There's no doubt about that. Now, what about the argument that whatever happens in New Hampshire, you're so far behind in South Carolina, you can't see George W. Bush's taillights, and there's no way you can win them. Well, I think recent polls show that we've closed uh, some 25 points in the last couple of weeks, and we continue to close. But what's going to happen if I win tonight? I've got the megaphone now. I've got it. And my message is going to be listened to in South Carolina, all over the country, and strangely enough, all over the world. That's my chance to get my message out of reform, of leadership, and the ability to, to assume the most awesome responsibilities in the world. That's where I have the megaphone tonight, and that'll make a huge amount of difference, not only in South Carolina, but all, all over the country. George W. Bush, in both in Iowa and here in New Hampshire, where you put practically all your chips, he does very well with Republicans. He does less well with independents and swing voters. You do better with independents and swing better voters. Look, the entire Republican establishment is lined up behind Governor Bush. If you want the status quo, then you obviously don't want me as your nominee. But we're having a great time, an insurgency campaign. I can't tell you how happy I am and how my life really has been enriched by the experience of the last year. It's been marvelous. McCain began this day knowing he had to win here in New Hampshire. He was through tonight. He believes he has broken through big. Bush, with his large campaign war chest, could go on no matter what. CBS's Bill Whitaker is covering the Bush-McCain matchup. Bill? Dan, George W. Bush was counting on a bounce from Iowa to help him here in New Hampshire while John McCain focused like a laser on this first primary state. John McCain has been campaigning so long he can't seem to stop. He was out early, buoyed by returns from tiny Dixville Notch, which voted at midnight and made the morning headlines. But the landslide has started. The timber, we, got, we carried Dixville, Dixville Notch, 19 to 17. We voted for McCain. He targeted independent voters like this man and his wife. Uh, it was a toss-up between Bradley and McCain. And I'm, I'm upbeat. Despite trailing in late polls, Bush was upbeat and out early, too. His supporters convinced, win or lose, Bush will be the nominee. I, I think that George has the potential to be a great leader. Was New Hampshire tougher than expected? I always expected a tough battle. New Hampshire puts people through their paces. Now, John McCain needs to win New Hampshire if he hopes to go on, whereas Bush, with his money and his organization, can afford to fail here in New Hampshire and still be a factor in South Carolina and beyond. Dan? Bill Whitaker. And now about the Democrats. Bill Bradley needed an upset win here, or at the very least to hang very close to Gore to keep his campaign alive. Bradley tonight believes the independents have delivered big for him. CBS News Chief Washington correspondent John Roberts is covering the Bradley Gore face-off. John? Dan, after the drubbing he took in the Iowa caucuses, Bill Bradley is poised to make a strong finish here in this first in the nation primary and is promising to continue the fight. Reaching out for every vote he could in New Hampshire, Bill Bradley was already looking ahead to the next contest, the first so-called national primary in five weeks. March 7th is very important. Bradley has vowed to stay in the race at least that long, and he has the money to do it. Bill Bradley can hold a $20 million grudge with the money he's got left uh, against Al Gore, if it's that personal. Gore has the organization to dominate big state primaries, but he comes out of New Hampshire vulnerable, wounded by Bradley's attacks on his integrity and honesty. He is exposing aspects of the vice president that are going to be problematic for the Democrats in November. Late today, Bill Bradley challenged the vice president to have a debate once a week until the March 7th primary. The Gore campaign as much as accepted the offer, but reiterated its challenge to Bradley to cancel all 30-second advertising in favor of debates. Dan? John Roberts, by the way, we'll be interviewing both Governor Bush and John McCain tonight on 60 Minutes 2 here on CBS. On this broadcast, we'll have more about the New Hampshire primary later. Straight ahead, 
Wall Street watches the Fed, and Austria takes an ominous turn to the right. On the CBS Market Watch, the U.S. economy set a record today for the longest expansion ever, 107 months. Against that background, the Federal Reserve Board huddled for a two-day meeting, expected to raise interest rates again, question how much, to keep the economy from growing too fast. Wall Street is okay with that. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 100 points today. The Nasdaq soared 111. After months of bombing and weeks of fierce street fighting, Russia tonight may have won the Battle of Grozny. But it has not yet won the war in Chechnya. Russian forces have advanced into key areas of downtown Grozny, and the Islamic rebels said that they're retreating from the Chechen capital. But the Kremlin refused to confirm the report, apparently unwilling to admit that any rebels had escaped. In any case, the war is not over. More rebels are still holding out in the mountains of southern Chechnya, preparing for a counterattack. Conservatives in Austria today defied the threat of sanctions by the U.S. and the European Union. They agreed to form a coalition government with a right-wing party led by an admirer of Adolf Hitler. The U.S. says it will review its ties to Austria if and when this new government actually takes office. President Clinton was on the phone today trying to save the faltering peace process in Northern Ireland. He's talked with Protestant leader David Trimble and IRA backer Jerry Adams. Protestants accused the Catholic IRA of reneging on a commitment to disarm. Up next on the CBS Evening News, we'll show you the Russian spy who was Mr. Outside, but who was inside the U.S. State Department. Another pro football player is facing a charge of murder. All-pro linebacker Ray Lewis of the Baltimore Ravens is jailed without bond in Atlanta, charged in the deaths of two Ohio men. He says he didn't do it. The men were stabbed outside an Atlanta bar where a post-Super Bowl party spilled out into the street. Earlier this year, Ray Carruth of the Carolina Panthers was charged in the murder of his pregnant girlfriend. There's more tonight on the Russian spy recently expelled from the United States when he was caught listening to bugged conversations deep inside the U.S. State Department. As part of an investigation for 60 Minutes 2, CBS News correspondent Jim Stewart has this exclusive update. Until now, the public has never seen pictures of Stanislav Gusev. This is just some of the surveillance video of the Russian spy the FBI shot over several months as he monitored a listening device planted in the heart of the U.S. State Department. FBI officials say they first grew suspicious of Gusev because he was always changing his parking spot outside the State Department and because he kept fiddling with something in a handbag. I think the bag has some significance. I'm confident there was more than likely a piece of equipment in the bag. Agents eventually determined that Gusev was busy listening to a signal coming from the State Department where a bug had been planted in the wall molding of a conference room on the top level seventh floor. But it wasn't until they detained Gusev and recovered the bug that the FBI realized just how well the Russians had done. This was a very sophisticated device, technically sophisticated, that was very professionally placed within State Department. Gusev had diplomatic immunity and could not be charged with espionage, but he was kicked out of the country. That took care of the spy who was monitoring the bug, according to investigators. The only question remaining now is, who helped him put it there? Jim Stewart, CBS News at the FBI. Stuart will give you an exclusive look at the technology the Russians used in this startling spy operation and how the FBI cracked the case on 60 Minutes 2, tonight at 9, 8 Central. On the CBS Health Watch, a new Mayo Clinic study out tonight offers fresh evidence that women with serious chest pain get less hospital treatment than men do. The men were 72% more likely to receive complex medical tests. The authors of the study note this could mean that women are undertreated and or that men may be overtreated. Up next on CBS, an update on tonight's two breaking stories, the primaries here in New Hampshire and the surprises coming from them and the plane crash off the California coast. Updating the latest on the crash of Alaska Airlines Flight 261, signals have been picked up from the pingers on one or both of the jetliner's flight recorders at the crash site off California. No survivors have been found some 24 hours after the crash in 700 feet of water. Early evidence indicates a possible mechanical problem. 
Here in New Hampshire, most of the polls in the nation's presidential primary, first in the nation, close in just a few minutes. So at the very top of this hour, we're going to have some hard information for you, the latest results. And it looks like underdogs McCain and Bradley both are benefiting from a strong turnout of independent voters and voters who made up their minds at the last minute. And that's part of our world tonight. I'll be back later here on CBS with 60 Minutes 2. Bob Simon has a preview of some of that for you. We found a place where a woman is raped every 26 seconds. If that sounds horrifying, wait till you hear what's being done about it. We'll also have the latest New Hampshire primary results and on 60 Minutes 2, interviews with John McCain and Governor George W. Bush. All of that, 60 Minutes 2, tonight at 9, 8 Central Time. Now stay tuned to this CBS station. We get just past the hour, some surprising information on this New Hampshire primary. Dan Rather reporting for the CBS Evening News. I'll see you again very shortly. For news 24 hours a day, CBS.com on the Internet and on our interactive partner, America Online, at keyword CBS News.